Hey everyone, welcome to the Fuel the Fight podcast. Another great guest. We're, we just keep them coming. Um, Going to talk to you a little bit, give it you know a, a different perspective than we've given on any of our other uh, episodes in terms of uh, command. We've talked to other you know officers and in, in serving in those command positions, but we're lucky enough today to get a very busy individual, uh, Command Sergeant Major Sean Gurner of the 106th Signal Brigade. Uh, in in the studio today, and, and we're going to talk a little bit about his army progression uh, here. And I was lucky enough to serve with him at the 75th, uh, so it's it's great to also see him again. Uh, Sergeant Major Gurner, welcome to the show. How you doing? I'm doing well. Happy to be here. Thanks Aw- for having me. Awesome, awesome. We're we're happy to have you. One of the things I start off with, you know, any guest, uh, you know, wearing that uniform is kind of like, hey, what's your army story? What what brought you in the army? Um. Well, I was. Um, I wish I had something a little more glamorous, but uh, I'm an army brat. My my father was a uh, an infantry officer. Uh, he retired out of the uh, the Northern Virginia D.C. area out of the Pentagon, and um, I was I, I kind of lacked direction in high school. Kind of went to college because that's just kind of what you're supposed to do after high school, and um, just kind of struck out on my own and decided to uh, to enlist and uh, you know chose a specialty of satellite communications just because at the time I really didn't have any direction I didn't really know what I wanted to do when I grew up probably still don't um, still kind of looking for that uh, but uh, uh, I was really looking for a skill that would be tangible uh, after uh, serving in the military since my college experience didn't really work out I wasn't didn't really have the direction, didn't have the drive or motivation to, to succeed on my own. So to me, the military was kind of like, in the back of my mind, um, was kind of like a, a, a backstop to being able, you know, to, to, to striking out on my own. And um, when I went away to basic training, uh, what I realized very quickly was that while I was familiar with the the, the 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 military way of life, I was not very familiar with the army. But uh, being around uh, military um, uh, indivi- military minded individuals and um, drill sergeants and listening to the way people spoke, the just being on a military installation, I kind of felt like that was home to me. Um, and then. Uh, you know, went through basic training in AIT, uh, became a, 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 at the time, 31 Sierra, uh, satellite communication systems operator maintainer, volunteered for, uh, for airborne training and ended up at, uh, Fort Bragg, uh, and my first unit was the, the 112th, uh, special operations, uh, signal battalion, um, and then, you know, 9-11 happened, you know, you kind of, you kind of, you know, something like that happens, and now it's, you know, kind of game day, um, and been kind of all in with the military ever since. Concurrently to that, you know, met my wife. Um, uh, you know, we had, we, had, you know, my wife and I've been married since 2002, so uh, it's been 20 years. Um, wow. We Very have, good. yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah. yeah, 20 year anniversary coming up this month. Um, uh, our oldest daughter, uh, Jenna, um, is uh, 19 years old, but she was born with spina bifida. Uh, so special needs child, you know, 9-11's just happened. Um, I didn't deploy immediately to Afghanistan. I was part of the invasion of Iraq. Um, but I think just kind of that sense of purpose that I really, you know, at first the military for me was kind of just something to do with my life. Um, to, 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 to try to pull myself out of, like, I always kind of felt like I was just aimless, no direction. Um, and then, uh, you know, I was typical, probably spoiled officer's kid a little bit, you know. I mean, my parents were good parents, but um, I couldn't, you know, I, I, I got a little bit too much into the, you know, the social aspect of high school and all of that, right? I didn't focus on the right things when I was younger. Um, but I think 
9-11 and having kids and getting married and, you know, just kind of grew up really quick. And I was kind of all in as a soldier in, in the Army from that point on. Well, yeah, you, you say all in because, you know, when, when you think of, you know, when I think of somebody, the type of individual is going to become a satellite, you know, kind of operator. Mm -hmm. And then uh, for the folks who you see, you know, looking at your uniform and, and having, you know, worked with you is like, I, what led you to the 75th? Because that, that's kind of a, you, yeah. you've taken a very distinct, different path than most probably satellite operators, um, I'm imagining, in, t in terms of that career field. Yeah, so, uh, well, I was already in the special ops community, so to, so to say. We were, the, the 112th Signal Battalion supports Army Special Operations, and they still do, and they do it well. Um, but... Um, so we were part of the initial push, uh, into, you know, into Baghdad. Um, my team at the time, I was like the assistant team chief. I was a young E5, um, and we occupied, um, uh, we were attached to, uh, FOB 53, uh, third battalion, fifth special forces group. And we helped set up their basically long haul communications with the ANTSC 93 van and supplied a satellite link and technology has moved light years from what we were providing uh, back then. But while we were there, um, I was exposed to the Rangers a little bit. Uh, and in fact, my uh, company commander at the time, um, uh, he's now he's now down at uh, at SOCOM, uh, Colonel Joe Pyshock. He had actually just come from the third Ranger battalion and he had jumped into objective rhino um, wow. my my team my team sergeant um was a prior infantry uh nco from the 82nd and he was ranger qualified and uh after uh that deployment uh my team sergeant and my company commander went back to, my team sergeant went to at the time rope um and went to the 75th ranger regiment and my company commander um, also went back to the 75th Ranger Regiment to command the Regimental Signal Detachment, which turned into the RCC later on. And, uh, um, you know, that I, the one up drill, I stayed behind and led the team on another deployment in Mosul. And uh, that second deployment, we worked with the Rangers a little bit more. And I realized that. Um, you know, they were starting to get my MOS. Um, so I had the opportunity. That had never been, becoming a, a, a ranger satellite communications operator had, was never in the cards until they started to get those, the, the ranger regiment started to get those capabilities, you know, the RSTB, the, 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 the echo companies, um, things like that. So, uh, uh, you know, I volunteered, you know, because I, real, I realized quite frankly, um, they were, they were out, they were the ones that were out there kind of, you know, taking the fight to the enemy. Um, and I kind of felt like where we were, even with a, um, even supporting a, a, a special forces forward operating base, I felt like we were kind of defending in place and I kind of wanted to contribute to the fight a little bit more, um, you know. Um, and then there were other things as well, like I was concerned about, um, the op tempo and support for family because we have tremendous amount of special needs for my oldest daughter and uh, everyone that I talked to in the Ranger Regiment um, was like, hey, once you're part of this community, um, you know, very, very supportive of families and I, even to this day, I mean, uh, my wife, Danielle, she really, you know, she misses the closeness that she had with other Ranger spouses back then and stuff like that. It was always a very, it always felt like a very tight-knit uh, group. So that was part of the allure to go there as well. And the standards, I mean, I felt like part of me really just wanted to see if I could operate at that level, if I could make it into the Ranger Regiment, if I could, if I could do it. You know, there was a stigma around Ranger school and being a Ranger. Um, and I wanted to just see if I would, if I could, if I could make it quite frankly. No proving ground. I, I do want to circle back and just make sure for some of the lists. So, um, objective Rhino, that was Afghanistan. 
Yes. Right. Yeah. So, so it was a jump, uh, part of the initial invasion, I think an airfield in Afghanistan, uh, rope ranger orientation program. Um, now they have ranger assessment and selection phase one and phase two for, mm-hmm. for enlisted. That's how you get into ranger regiment. Mm-hmm. Um, RCC was the regimental communications company. Yes. Sir. Um, yeah. so, so that's, that's where, uh, you serve. No, that that's great. You know, it's, it's funny. You talk about the, the family environment. And uh, not to make this, uh, you know, all about how great the 75th is. <laughs> turn, yeah. turn, turn, turn the podcast. Done but, other stuff too. Yeah, but, yeah. yeah. It, it, but yeah. but I definitely relate, you know, just connected with what you said because I think of about even arriving to Joint Base San Antonio and everybody who served that we knew, you know, in the 75th have all like, you know, like a, I don't know if it's a moth to a flame or however you say it, you know, you just kind of put the signal up and like, oh, he, you know, he's here, he's here, you know, let's link up, let's talk. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so I get what you're saying about, yeah, there's just that, uh, unless you've been in the unit, you don't understand it. There's just that family kind of environment that is really uh, close knit. Other units might have it, but just from this perspective, yeah, I, I agree. Yes, sir. So, you know, Command Star Major, mm-hmm. I, I don't, God, what, what percentage of the Army population are Command Star Majors? Uh, so I'm told like 1%. 1%. I, I try not to focus on that. I try not to focus but, but, yeah. but, but so I, cause I want to, you are the, 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 the first and only command star major I've had on the show. Oh, so, so you were it. And, right. and so I want to, to share, cause there might oh, be a lot of, up. yeah, yeah. A lot of young guy. soldiers <laughs> listening out there yeah. that maybe have that in their, you know, uh, in their sights. And it's like, mm-hmm. Hey, what's the greatest part of being a command star major? Um, I think the greatest part of being a command sergeant major is realizing the amount of uh, influence that you have over um, the over your organization, right? Um, you are able to kind of shape and control the entire climate, especially if you're, um, you know, effective at communicating your boss's vision and intent and you play a key role in, you know, they say, uh, you know, uh, what is the saying? Uh, cult, I heard it, uh, culture eats vision or strategy for breakfast, you know. I like that. As the sergeant major, you're really influencing the culture. Your, your ability to communicate and translate vision and intent to your organization can make or break the culture of your organization. And... Um, the most important thing in my mind that a sergeant major does is have the trust and confidence of their boss to be able to uh, inf- to to um, digest information and be able to provide candid and trusted uh, feedback and guidance when asked. And be able, yeah, and sometimes that's difficult because sometimes uh, commanders need to hear things that they may not necessarily want to hear behind closed doors. Um, but those those types of things, in my mind, are the most important things that sergeant majors do. Uh, the thing I probably enjoy the most, though, is what I've been doing all week, which is our best warrior competition, going out there with the soldiers and and just being able to to watch them. Um, you know, grow and develop and learn, um, I think, and, and succeed, you know, that to me is honestly probably what's kept me in the army, you know, past the, you know, the, the, uh, the, the infamous, you know, 20 year mark. Right. So, um, yeah. no, yeah. that's, that's great. Yeah. And, and yeah, it just came from a stress shoot out at Camp Bullis, you know, so yeah. out there training. So that, that's awesome. What, now you talk about you know kind of the greatest part, but what what's the most challenging part of being a you know a command sergeant major to, to your experience thus far? Um, for me, it's always been it's real. I mean, honestly, I mean any any senior leader, if they've got it figured out, then let me know. But it's always balance and time management, that kind of thing. I mean, literally, sometimes you're you're. You, you obviously can't be two places at once, but sometimes we commit calendar fratricide. And um, I think the biggest challenge for me personally and professionally is being able to balance the requirements of, you know, um, the job 
with the needs of the family. And, um, you know, I think we, we, right now it's, you know, people first in the Army. Hey, peop got it, people first. We say that, um, but it's still, I think, for senior leaders sometimes we get in our little, like, we, you know, we, I get in my little compartmentalized box where I'm thinking about work and I'm thinking about the mission and I may not be thinking about the family and what's going on at home. Um, and being able to navigate that and transition from being dad to being sergeant major or from being husband to being sergeant major, right? Those are not always the same. Um, you're not always looking at problems through the same lens depending on, you know, which, which one of those boxes you're in at the moment, if that makes sense. No, that, that makes uh, so balance, perfect sense. Balance yeah. in the short, you know, the short way to say it. No, and, and you, you it's, it's probably very important to uh, change uh, lens so you're not, you know, starting major lens with your family. <laughs> yes, I, sometimes that happens. <laughs> right? Sometimes right. I think we're all yeah. guilty of, of that. Yeah. yeah so, um, so, you know, we, we like to focus on holistic health and, and fitness, sure. um, yeah. and that, that's a great initiative the Army's really kind of putting on. We had the Ranger Athlete Warrior Program, mm -hmm. we were a regiment, mm -hmm. but, but how is, you know, you know, your holistic kind of health been impacted as a senior leader? Uh, I think uh, for me, uh, I'm the textbook, you know, the struggle is real, right? Mm -hmm. Like the um, holistic health and fitness, I always, um, I think in the Ranger Regiment, we were probably ahead of that. I think when I read the holistic health and fitness, uh, when I read through it, I was like, oh, I've seen this before. <laughs> like, this is this is raw. This is raw 2.0. This is raw 3.0, right? Um, but I think uh, when we, when I really look back at how I came up in the Army, we never really did focus on holistic health and fitness if i'm be i mean if we're being realistic we focused on you know running and running faster than anyone else and further than anyone else um and keeping the weight off and working hard and playing hard and that kind of mentality and you get to kind of a certain age and that kind of catches up with you right they say you can't outwork a bad diet and I will tell you that if you do enough PT, if, if it's a matter of input versus output, you probably can outwork a bad diet. Um, but eventually that catches up with you at a certain age when you have other things that kind of just start to, other mm -hmm. little bumps and bruises that become a little bit more than bumps and bruises. And uh, the, the, uh, what I've found for me is proper nutrition and the proper amount of sleep is huge when it comes to my performance, especially now with the ACFT and uh, and every and just everything else. You know, I mean, just just my um, my ability to focus and um, give you know place the proper amount of attention to the right situations that to 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 certain situations to place the amount of attention that they deserve on them. Um, I have to, I have to be well rested, you know, and I can't, I can't go out and do a two and a half hour workout. Um, cause my endor, if I do that, my endorphins will be up and I'll feel great. I'll feel like I got it in, but an hour and a half into my day, I'm going to want to go take a nap. Right. Um, if I go on a bike ride with Lieutenant Colonel Menendez, <laughs> for first bike ride and we're going like 50, 60 miles. Yeah. I come home, <laughs> I come home, and my wife's like, what are you, what are you, you just going to sit on the couch all day? I'm like, yeah, kind of, like, I'm done, right? So um, I've learned that sometimes it's more about quality than quantity when it comes to working out. Um, Nutrition-wise, I've learned that there's a certain amount of calories I need to consume every day. That's probably between about 23 and 2,900 calories a day, depending on how active I am. And I know what my protein, you know, fat and carb macros are that I need to get, you know. And I kind of try to stick to that. Um, that's what works for me. Um, but all in all, I think it's good that we are, the Army is trying to 
you know, change the focus from just being about physical fitness and, you know, one protein, one starch kind of thing in the defect to holistic health and fitness, including uh, behavioral health as well, right? And your ability to recover, you know. Um, you know, you don't get, if you go, you know, I'm, I'm, um, uh, I've found that my body responds more to strength training. So that's what I've been kind of focusing on uh, more for probably the last couple of years. Um, because the more muscle mass that I tend to carry, the better I feel, um, the better I do. You know, I'll never, I'm one of those guys that'll never make, I'll probably never make weight when it comes to height and weight, but my measurements are okay because I stay in the gym and I lift weights. Um, but uh, uh, what I've found is that if, um, if I'm smart about the way that I do it and when I consume my nutrition and when I rest, you don't, you don't get stronger while you're lifting weights. You get stronger while you're sleeping. You know, you right. get stronger yeah. when you drink a protein shake and take some melatonin mm -hmm. and go to bed, right? So uh, I've had to learn that over the over the years because you know back especially you know in the Ranger Regiment, and I'm glad that they're focusing on kind of training smarter for the long game. But I mean, it was it was run fast, run far, lift heavy weights. You kind of had to be able to do everything, you know, because when Raw was starting out, you were you were deadlifting as much as you could deadlift, and you were running five miles in under forty <laughs> minutes, and you were, you know, you you were doing the uh, the RPAT. I think oh, the yeah, RPAT yeah, is the still RPAT. a thing too. Yes, and, yes. And then they put a time standard on the RPAT uh, yeah. as well, right? And I was, like I said, I was never a fast guy. I was always fast enough. Um, but uh, I've learned that you got to be kind of well rounded, and it's. For me, I mean, it's I've learned also that like, hey, it's okay if I can't run. Like right now, uh, I'm dealing with the issue with my right hip, and I it kills me that I can't really run the way that I used to, you know. Um, but but I can swim, I can bike, I can walk, um, I can row, and I can go out and run two miles and pass the ACFT just fine. But I can't. So when I do run, I'm doing like, you know, I'm, I'm doing interval training. You know, I'm trying to make sure that I'm not overdoing it uh, when it comes to uh, volume uh, and mileage. But, I'm, but, the, but the mileage that I am getting is quality mileage, uh, if that makes sense. That makes perfect sense. I know that was like all over the place there. No, no, that was great. No, there's, that. there's a lot of lessons to be learned from there in terms of understanding that, yeah, there's, you know, habits that – young you know war fighters can get away with when you're younger kind of we talked about trying to you know outwork yeah. that that bad diet there might be some situations you know you're in where yeah you can do yeah. that you can eat you know whatever and, and just because you're exercising so much but if you set that habit then all of a sudden you become into a world where yeah. either you don't have the time or you, you suffer an injury right yeah. uh, and then i also like you know where you talk about that yeah okay i can't run five miles, 10 miles, you know, at a clip like I used to, but I can still do all these other activities and I can still train for the ACFT two mile, just have to be very, um, you know, kind of smart and, and um, uh, specific about when I do run. So those, yeah, those very runs, you, yeah. you gotta be deliberate. I'll tell you, I've taken the ACFT five or six times. I don't think it's a hard test to pass, uh, but I'll tell you every time I've taken it, I typically score right around 500. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not in danger of getting a 600. <laughs> uh, I, um, but what I'll tell you is, every time I've taken it has been in a small group of soldiers, and it's not like we're not working towards success with the ACFT. I mean, we're training for it. Uh, but every time I've taken it, two, one or two soldiers has failed mm. the event, uh, and it's usually what I see them fail the most visible is the run. Mm -hmm. um, and they'll fail because they're either not running, literally not. I saw a soldier literally not run fast enough. Soldier ran like a 24 minute, mm -hmm. two mile, um, or they stop. They they kind of run out of gas. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the, you know. And then I kind of you, you kind of sit back and think about it, and you're like, okay, well, do we have to do the ACFT at zero, mm -hmm. six thirty? Like, do we, do we have to do it while everybody has an empty stomach? Right. Like 
would it be a good idea instead of doing the ACFT in the summertime? Like maybe you do your ACFT in the times when it's a little cooler outside and you do it in the middle of the day so that everybody has the opportunity to 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 hydrate and, and and consume some good nutrition before they get out there and they they take the test because it is a in my in my you know I think it's a it's a pretty it's a pretty taxing test physically just because you're going from one event to the next and uh, the plank event uh, is I mean it, the plank event is pretty challenging mm -hmm. I gotta say I, I've I've been I've been working on my planks in the gym. <laughs> I wish you could, if I would max today, yeah. if I could do this, but because you have to do this, because you have to keep your hands apart. That's the. Uh, I'm working on it, but. No, uh, it, you know, and in, in you bring up great points, and I'm glad uh, you do, and you know, put this out there in the universe, because I've always said, I, you know, for my program, the little thing I can control, my 13 students, we do PT in the afternoons after class. Why? Mm -hmm. Because. I don't want to have them, you know, wake up at four. I know some of them live, you know, far off post, you know, whatever. To come in to to work out at five in the morning, you know, they're they're not going to get enough sleep, and then going to class, and I'm exp I'm going to teach them, you know, they're, they're not going to get. So I I agree. We got to look at doing it. And funny enough, when I was in the Department of Physical Education at West Point, as a department, we would take our ACFT like at ten o'clock. Right. Like we would, you know, now we had the luxury of kind of that that schedule. Or at lunchtime, sometimes we would do it at lunch um, for, for just the folks in the department. But I did notice, like, the first time I went there, it was like my score was higher than it had been at the previous unit where we were doing it at like five in the morning. And I, I wake up and eat something. I make, you know, yeah. dietitian. I wake up, I yes, make sure, sure I eat something. <laughs> but even still, I'm not optimal. I'm just not at five at six in the morning, you know, versus if you, if you have me perform at like, you know, 10 or even at like 1500 is kind of where I'm. Well, I feel. plus. Plus, it's like, you know, if you, it, uh, for me anyway, when I'm exercising, I like to, when I feel like I have a backstop, I'm just trying to fit it into, I'm training to time instead of to standard. Mm -hmm. You know, you always say in the Army, we train to, we train to standard, not to yeah. time, right? But sometimes, for whatever reason, you only got a certain amount of time to yourself, and then you have other things that you have to go do. So, um, ironically, my last duty station was in, uh, Colorado Springs, and uh, we were at. Well, we started at. P we bracked from Peterson Air Force Base to uh, to um, to Fort Carson, Colorado. Well, actually, we were just off Peterson Air Force Base, but we did our PT formations. Our headquarters did our PT formations at Peterson, and I uh, observed from afar the Air Force there. Kind of had it. I think they're Peterson Space Force Base mm -hmm. now, but they actually had it right. Uh, they the Air Force would go out there at like 1530 every day and they would be they would just be out there crushing it for a couple hours at the end of the day mm -hmm. whereas we'd be out there you know you know zero six you know, <laughs> saluting the flag like we're supposed to do you know in formation and doing the prep drill and hitting the track and doing whatever but I, I kind of always was like well they're doing it backwards, but they, and I, you know, I didn't really, I, we, I had, my, I was busy, but, mm -hmm. you know, just from an outside looking in, um, they were, they looked more fit than most of the soldiers <laughs> yeah. because, and I don't know, I, yeah. I, maybe they just, maybe they, they did a better job at holistic health and fitness, but from what I saw, they were, they were out there crushing it in the afternoons yeah. and, uh, and they were coming, but they were coming into work at you know seven o'clock right and uh you know zero seven instead of you're at pt at six thirty, you're at work at zero nine you know you get you get you do pt for an hour you get an hour and a half for lunch and a shower and uh most of the time that that doesn't work out like I, even me like if i you know this morning you know i got up and i got on my exercise you know kind of lame but i got on my you know my little we have like a fake Peloton, mm. and I do Zwift on there, but you know, kind of like a like a trainer. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. So I got up this morning and did my little bike workout, but I had to be done by, you know, six thirty, so that I could be out at Camp Bullis by zero seven. So um, uh, I don't know. It's no, it, re rethinking when we we exercise. No, I'm I'm big on. I'm so glad you hit that. We we didn't even coordinate that because I I do think it's silly to say. 
PT has to happen this early in the morning, especially when we talk about sleep. You know, if, if I'm going to make soldiers get up at, you know, four in the morning, I'm probably not giving them optimal sleep, especially if you have kids and, you know, you got to get them down and it's just not realistic. So I, I, I like that, um, rethinking that. Kind of switching gears, uh, what kind of, you know, health advice or, or, you know, holistic health and how they do it, would you give junior NCOs climbing the ranks to prepare them for these greater positions of responsibility? I would say that the uh, the biggest thing it would be just to, to 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 try not to let yourself get out of shape. It's tough. To, it's much easier to maintain a certain level of fitness than to uh, let than to try to regain uh, a certain level of fitness. If that makes sense, that's the biggest thing that I would say. And I did, I haven't uh, quite frankly I have not done a good job of that throughout my career. Um, I, I think I did okay. I think the best I did at it throughout my career was while I was serving in the Ranger Regiment because that was just kind of like you 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 just had to present a certain you know image while you're there, especially as a senior NCO, and you had to meet standards, right? Standards based organization, but the whole Army is honestly a standards based organization as well. So. The more physically fit that you can keep yourself, um, the higher level of physical fitness that you can maintain, the better so that you're not playing catch up. Um, and then a caveat to that and something that we haven't touched on when it comes to holistic health and fitness is uh, uh, alcohol, mm -hmm. tobacco and alcohol. You know, I think that I've seen tobacco use has definitely declined and I think that's great, um, but the Army holistically has to take a hard look at how, um, how, how much, uh, you know, alcohol w weighs into our, you know, honestly, our culture. I hate to say it. I hate to say that. You might have to edit that out, but I'm not saying I'm glamorizing alcohol, but I'm saying that um, a lot of young no. A lot of young soldiers have issues with holistic health and fitness because they abuse alcohol. And if you look at what your periodic health assessment says is alcohol abuse, I think there's a if if we're going off of the numbers in your periodic health assessment, alcohol abuse is much much more prevalent and normal than we think it is, I think. Um so and what I have found is I was, you know, you know, work hard, play hard for a long time. But what I have found throughout the years is the more I can stay away from alcohol, um, and I, I, I do, you know, I like, I like to drink a cold beer and, you know, I have a glass of whiskey now and then too, right? But the more I stay away from alcohol, the better I feel and the better I perform, uh, period, right? So regardless of what your goals are, whether it's strength, endurance, um, sp speed, uh, you know, um, uh, if, if, you know, you're, what you're doing in the kitchen plays just as much, um, of a factor into that, um, as your, your training program does. No, I, I think that's great. And, and I think the alcohol is a fair comment and, and it is in the culture. It, I, I think it's, it's gotten a little better, but I mean, you know, you think of like dining ends and the grog. Or, yeah, or sure, you know, yeah. those sort of things, or, um, you know, even uh, not as much, but like the officer and NCO club, you know, people would meet for drinks after, you know, it's, it's yeah, 1700, call, and, yeah, yeah. you know, and, and so it, yes, there sir. was drinking was always kind of in the military culture. You can look at history, you know, and, and see that and, and, and understanding its impacts. And so I think it's, it's nice to address that head on, just like you did and say, Hey, this is something to look at. And um, I've, done a you know a fair amount of research read a lot of literature i've yet to see one paper that says alcohol improves performance yes, i've yet sir. to see yeah. one paper that says alcohol improves decision making I, i'm not so, yeah know. i'm definitely not saying you know i mean look it's okay at right. those types of events to have a couple of drinks and loosen up and be responsible but we've got to do i think ho holistically um we have to make sure that we do a good job of uh fostering the maturity that you know soldiers need to 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 have before before they start to 
you know, lean on things like alcohol to unwind or relax. Right. right? It, beca- it becomes because their it coping mechanism. It becomes a coping mechanism or a habit kind of thing. So, um, but that plays into holistic health and fitness in my mind. Um, just, and and this, exp- you know, I was a, so, you know, serving in the Ranger, I was a platoon sergeant in the RCC. I was a first sergeant. I was the Echo Company first sergeant, support company, uh, first sergeant at 1st Battalion. Um, and, uh, and then I went back to Fort Bragg to be a first sergeant, a second, uh, headquarters first sergeant at, uh, back at the 112th signal battalion. And there I had soldiers that were, you know, struggling with height and weight and APFT. And this is like the only airborne signal battalion in the army. And I'm thinking, wow, how can this be? Like we have... We're not, it's not the Ranger Regiment, but they, we've got standards here as well. And what we found, what I found, was, hey, these guys are drinking like you know a six pack every every night. Yeah, that's that's about you know depending on what kind of beer you're drinking, right. that could be anywhere between five hundred and two thousand calories. That could be you could be doubling your daily caloric intake just from having a six pack of beer. You know and. Um, and we had to kind of we had to kind of focus on that and and refine that and change that, mm-hmm. um, and then kind of similar you know uh, from there I went back to the Ranger Regiment, um, and then when I took a battalion it was a strategic battalion full of satellite controllers, um, and that unit is now I think moving to the Space Force but uh, we had very very similar issues there with holistic health and fitness you know you got. Uh, different kind of stress from being a war fighter, but you know you're on constant shift work, 12 hours on, 12 12 hours off, three days on, two days off, two days on, three days off, 365, 24/7. You're on days, nights, whatever that looks like. Um, not a very physically demanding job, but a very mentally demanding uh, and stressful job. Um, and the whole you, when you can't those. Those soldiers can't, they literally weren't enough hours in the day for them to focus on their physical training the way that, uh, the way that we did in the Ranger Regiment, mm. right? But um, that's where I really learned how much um, the, the nutrition and the, uh, the mental and emotional health played into your holistic health and, and fitness. No, that's that's great. One of the you know kind of last question I want to ask you because um, you know you talk so much about for like the the non commissioned side, mm-hmm. um, but I think this is really important. Is you know what advice would you give like junior officers, those those new lieutenants, mm-hmm. you know, which I, I deal with a lot in regards of how best to work with their non commissioned officer is how to kind of um, get you know get that relationship started off on the right foot and then how best to interact and work with them. Is there any Things you've seen over the years, best practices, or or maybe worst practices that to put out to say, hey, don't do this. You know, uh, I've seen the worst practices. The only the only bad things that I've seen, uh, I've seen, um, where you have, uh, you know, and me, I tend to be. You know, my father was an officer, mm-hmm. um, and his father was a uh, was a command sergeant major. Oh, wow. Um, so, uh, I was kind of throughout the years of me being in the military, um, I've had a lot of really great officer leadership and I've had a lot of really great NCO leadership, more, much more positive than negative experiences with my leadership overall. And I've had a great mentor as well in my father. So him and I have talked about the relationship with NCOs and officers a lot. Um, and uh, the only thing I've seen that was that's really negative is when a weak NCO is paired up with a weak uh, lieutenant, and uh, by weak I mean someone who's not necessarily focused on the right things, or someone who um, uh, continuously tries to undermine the officer, or you know, oh the lieutenant this, my mm-hmm. lieutenant that, that kind of stuff, like the lieutenant jokes kind of stuff. There's really no place for that. 
at the end of the day, uh, as a non-commissioned officer, you want your lieutenant, you want your officer to be successful because that's a reflection on you and it's a positive reflection on your soldiers, right? And uh, what I would say is um, the, the, the best thing that a young officer can do is try to develop trust with your senior non-commissioned officer and really get to know them um, the best that you can and then get to know the soldiers um, within the platoon or the section uh, as well. Um, don't ever, uh, don't, I would also say be leery because there is cert there are certain things for NCO business, and I'll put the quotation marks up. Um, but really, at the end of the day, there's really no such thing as NCO business. I mean, there are certain things that NCOs do that officers, for the most part, should understand, but not necessarily be too involved in if, the if things are happening the right way. Um, but be leery of the term NCO business because there's really just leader business and if you have a good non-commissioned officer, um, they will be the ones that are teaching you that. Um, and, and hey, don't ever, as a young, especially as a young, inexperienced officer, you're also a young, inexperienced soldier, right? So, uh, but don't ever let your lack of experience intimidate you to the point that you give up what I would call your moral high ground. So if you see something that's, um, you know, if you see if you see anything that is challenging any any army value or legally uh, legally morally ethically, if anything that's not on your ethical decision making, um, you know, triangle. Um, then, then always just do the right thing, you know. I, I mean, really, at the end of the day, you, you can't go wrong if you're doing the right thing. And, you know, loyalty between an officer and an NCO, yeah, you're loyal to the individuals that you work with, but you're also loyal to the institution of the Army and the nation, right, and the values that we all signed up for together. Um, and that I've seen, uh, unfortunately, I have seen that um, get twisted around and get young leaders in trouble sometimes. Mm. So, no. Th thanks for that sharing that. that. That's that's great, um, you know, uh, wisdom there. And I, I definitely wanted to cover that since you have that kind of you know unique perspective um, of seeing that, and especially as your dad being an officer, and then yeah, yeah it's <laughs> the family uh, keeps yeah. rotating here. Um, uh, you know, any closing thoughts, any book recommendations, any things for the young soldiers out there before we wrap up? I know you got places to go, so I don't want to keep you too long. Uh, no, no, no real, uh, no real book recommendations from a leadership perspective. Um, we're, uh, man, I'm having a, I'm having a little bit of a brain fart, but we're doing like a LPD series right now on one of Brene Brown's books. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Brene Brown, the power yes. of vulnerability. Yeah, probably want to edit that part out. So yeah. no books. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So probably, yeah, yeah. I was trying to think. I can, I can look it up. I can, I can see. Yeah, anything I know by you know Simon Simon Sinek. Leaders eat last yeah, is always yeah. a good good one go to. But um, as far as last words, what I'll say is you know, um, I, you know. Just happy to be here, happy to serve, and you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'll, I'll, I'm staying in the army as long as I feel like I'm, uh, as long as I feel like I'm making a difference, uh, you know. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, when it comes to fueling the fight in holistic health and fitness, um, it's easy to get as, a, especially as a senior leader. It's easy to make excuses for yourself because you're so busy with other stuff to say, well, I don't have time for this or I'm, I can't eat like that because I've got this going on. And the reality is when you do that, you're, you're actually shorting yourself. Uh, you can't 
impact your organization and you can't be value added to your family back to the balance piece if you're not taking care of your own holistic health and fitness so um you know as much as we talked about you know um you know your organization and leadership and stuff like that you know you've got to be able to take care of yourself first because if you, if you're if you're not straight then you can't impact other things if that makes sense no it makes it makes perfect yeah. sense and i appreciate that and i think that's a good closing line you got to take care of yourself yeah. so you can take care of others uh command star major gurner thank you so much for joining us i, I know people yeah. are gonna get a lot of value out of uh you know listening to this and and learning all the great lessons you shared uh, so that's this for this episode thanks for listening until next time